ourselves. Let's pray. Lord, you are the strength to those who suffer and comfort to those who grieve. Let the prayers of your children who are in trouble rise to you. We claim your promises of wholeness as we pray for those who are ill or suffering loss and long for your healing touch. Make the weak strong, the sick healthy, and confirm those who serve them as agents of your love. To everyone in distress, grant mercy, grant relief, grant refreshment. And as we begin to rebuild, we commend our neighbours to your care. Give us strength of purpose and concern for others that we may create a community where your will may be done. Surround those who have been shaken by tragedy with a sense of your present love and hold them in faith. Though they are lost in grief, may you, they find you and be comforted. Lord, we ask you to be with us each day, each hour, in every moment and give us strength and hope. We ask this in your precious son's name. Amen. Good morning. Sorry about the random stuff flashing up on the screen during the prayers, but we have been having some issues this morning. They've been having a nightmare over there in the corner, but they tell me they fixed it now, so that's great. We'll start with an introduction. We give thanks this morning as we enter this place that is the house of the Lord, to whom we give, come to give thanks in worship. God's love and blessing is upon us as we gather here and worship together and enjoy the company of other Christians. We give thanks for all the blessings we have in the week that has passed and look forward to all the blessings and all that is good in the week to come. Many will notice that this meeting this morning was advertised as being led by Jason Wearmouth, and although he was prepared and he was ready to lead this meeting, I decided that it was unfair to ask him to complete this so close to the funeral of his grandmother. So after discussion with Jason, it was decided to move the service he was leading until later in the year. I thank him for his service and commitment, and we will look forward to hearing Jason preach in the near future. And I hope you understand why this decision has been made. The service today was prompted by a few sayings that kept coming back to me as I was thinking about planning the meeting this morning. The first being, a hammer is only a solution when the issue is a nail. I am sure many of you will have heard this phrase and I'm sure I have heard it from this place in the recent past. The second being you need to think outside the box. And I'm sure you've all heard that phrase probably a few too many times. I'm later going to try and link this to the Bible reading Mark 2, 1 to 16, which again is a portion of the Bible I am sure you will all have knowledge of already. These two phrases can mean many different things depending on the context in which they are used. So what, I am, what am I trying to say this morning? It is often said, and it's, it is very often prover, proven, that, it's, that it is counterproductive to use the same solution to solve every problem or apply the same ideas when you're implementing every initiative. This is a real problem for us as human beings because we are hardwired to do what we know has worked in the past, rather than try a different task, a different tack in these situations. As most people get older or have been in the same position for a while, they tend in the main to fall back on learned experience, and there is a good reason why that happens. For example, it's a good trait that stops you touching a hot fire again and again, always ending up in pain and discomfort. However, that means we need your help as a leadership team or other leaders within the core, as we are not here to establish our ideas, nor, we, nor do we have the solution to every problem. Past experience gets in the way and will not always get us to the right decision every time. That's where everyone comes into the mix because everyone can have good ideas. Then the leadership team becomes enablers 
to help to make ideas and solutions possible and, en and enable more radical kingdom building activities to take place. The other thing we need to remember is that the leadership team does not remain forever. And at some point, maybe in the short to medium term, the members of that leadership team will change. It will require people to be ready to step up and we all need to be ready uh, to take that opportunity. Greater engagement with the process of leadership now will assist whenever change happens in the future. Change is good if we are ready for it. Taking a role with accountability and leadership adds to your sense of belonging and fulfillment. You are all special to God and to this core, and God has planned for us all if, we, if only we engage. As it says in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Later in the meeting, I will try to link these thoughts to Jesus, Jesus' forgiveness and healing a paralyzed man, which again can be found in Mark. Our first song, I'm not sure, entirely sure why, but I could not get this song out of my head to start this morning's service. It may be because we are expecting at Easter a visit from the cadets from the William Booth College, or my thinking is pushed in this direction for another reason. However, there is no wrong time to sing the founder's song, O oh, Boundless Salvation. That is song 509 for those using song books. We can't really sing all the verses, so we'll sing verse 1, 2, 4, 5, and 7. And now we've got the computer working again. You should be able to get them on the screen. But if not, you'll have to share the song books that you have. Thank you, Ben.
Hello, and welcome to the third of our films for this year's Self-Denial Appeal. For this year's Self-Denial Appeal, we are focusing on children and young people and how the Salvation Army is equipping, enabling and supporting them around the world. And this week, we're in Moldova. It's early morning in Yelabeni, a small town in Moldova. In the Salvation Army building, Dimitri is getting ready for school. Yeah. I'm 14 years old, I'm from I'm at 6 o'clock and after that I'm standing, I'm cleaning my teeth, then I'm going to eat. А одеваюсь и потом я выхожу на остановку и сажусь на маршрутку и еду до школы. Dmitry fled here from Ukraine with his granddad after the fighting started in February last year. But this is not the first time he's had to flee from conflict. He was born in Donetsk, close to the Russian border. It's been unstable there since 2014. One night, his home was bombed and his parents and siblings were killed. He was the only survivor. I don't know if it was a little bit. It was about seven years old. In the first time, they were very strong. Это Донецк сильно бомбили, Луганск бомбили очень сильно. Мы прятались в подвалах, получается. Я точно уже не помню. Пальчик убери из Донецка. А. Не, покажи рядом пальчик, чтобы был. Дмитрий и его дед уехали в Одессу и жили там. Но когда бомбинг начался в прошлом году, они знали, что они не могли остаться. Они собрали, что они могли and headed over the closest border to Moldova. Были такие переживания, что за за наш дом было переживание, за за родственников было очень сильно переживание и и было насчёт переживания, что мы выйдём с Украины, что не выйдём, что границы закроют очень быстро и millions of people like Dmitry and his granddad fled Ukraine. In Poland, Romania and Moldova, Savish Army teams provided food and emergency accommodation. Savish Army halls were cleared to make space for beds and Savish Army kitchens provided extra meals. Some families stayed just a few nights before moving on to other countries in Europe. Others have stayed longer. The Savish Army has offered shelter to Dmitry and his granddad for as long as they need. Все хорошо, мы тут спим хорошо. Тепло тут на втором этаже, на первом этаже так чуть-чуть холодновато. Но я сплю здесь. А деда там спит, получается, на... я здесь сплю, а деда там спит. Когда я первый раз приехал сюда, Леовены, в эту церковь, я сначала переживал, думал, что тут вообще на другом языке все разговаривают именно. Но потом я привык к этому языку, меня начали мази не понимать. Over the last year, the core in Yelaveni has sheltered scores of families. 
providing accommodation, food and support. At the moment, there are 12 Ukrainians staying here. Мне очень тут все нравится, потому что тут открытая местность, и тут можно просто посидеть там, поразговаривать хотя бы с кем-то. На втором этаже тоже все хорошо, можно поиграть и с детками. As the conflict has continued, so has the Savish Army's support. They've opened up extra places in after-school clubs to help Ukrainian children who haven't been able to go to school. They're distributing school textbooks and supplies to young people who need them. And they've been distributing vouchers that can be used to buy food and provisions in local supermarkets. Dmitry and his granddad aren't thinking of returning anytime soon, so they're looking for a local apartment. But in the meantime, the Corps has welcomed them and they've settled in. Dmitry had some questions about faith and asked one of the members here. И он мне рассказал, как можно в Бога поверить и принять веру. И а теперь я приходил, тут слушал все, вставал, постоянно молился за, за близких, за родственников. И, и, получается, и, и из-за этого я уже поверил в Бога и начал его верить. церковь мне что потому что нравится и, э, тут можно помолитесь там хотя бы в бога там хотя бы поверить и тут может все хорошее рассказать о мире там о природе ну обо всем может рассказать we look forward to seeing you then.
Thank you to the Sing Company this morning and a special thanks to our soloists. What a lovely contribution to our service. We now can remain seated for our second song, a song well known to most, which is As the Deer. For those using the songbook, that's song 571. This song was, has a fantastic tune, but more importantly, it has fantastic words to go along with it. Please take the opportunity to observe, absorb the words as we sing this song straight through to the end. And um, in the Bible reading, I like to make that a, something that we can all take part in. So we're going to split between leader, women and men. Um, the, in, the information should be on the screen. A few days later, when Jesus entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can sin but God alone? 
immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to a man, Your sins are forgiven. Or to say, Get up, take your mat and walk. I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Once again, Jesus went outside beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and the Levi, Levi got up and followed him. We have many things happening in the next few weeks and months, so please give your attention to Ross as he outlines his announcements today. Thank you. I'll just outline the next few weeks, not the next few months, because I think you might uh, switch off a bit if I did that. But I will say at this point that there's a newsletter which has just been emailed round to everyone, and it's available in paper form as well. That's for uh, the month of March, and that outlines everything that's going on, including the Easter weekend. So I would encourage you to pick that up and have a look at that. Now, I've been sitting next to Richard and Lucas and Valentina, but I want to publicly welcome you this morning. Um, I obviously wish it was different circumstances, the reason for your visit, but nonetheless, we're, we're delighted to have you with us this morning. Also, I um, want to thank Anne Tweddle in, uh, for the flowers. Those are in memory of Sid after the uh, anniversary of his death recently. It's also nice to have Daniel back with us from university. I'm sure you were disappointed with the football last night. I'm sure you are there, but uh, nonetheless, again, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you to Colin, as he's already said, for stepping in this morning and for your preparation. Next Sunday morning, which is the 26th, Major Carrie James will lead. And then the following on Sunday, the 5th of March, we're looking forward to John Laverick, who will be leading our service. And we thank you, John, in anticipation of your preparation to that. And on Sunday, the 12th of March, that's our Young People's Weekend, and we've got special guests, Majors Donald and Anne Montgomery, who are coming back to, to lead us. So we're really excited and pray about that event. The Lent lunches start this week. So those are when the churches together in Bedlington um, gather. They have previously been on a Thursday, but from this, for this year they're going to be on a Friday. Um, and they're actually all going to be taking place here. So that's between 10 and 12 a.m. every Friday for the next six weeks. Uh, it says there's coffee, tea, cake, and a chat. And then at 12 o'clock till 12.15, there's a short reflection. And that'll be led by different people from the churches, but um, would encourage you to come along to any of those if you can, but particularly on Friday the 17th of March, someone from our church will be leading that reflection. So that's every Friday, 10 till 12, with a short reflection afterwards. Just a reminder as well, there's a, a sign-up sheet in the, the foyer for Sunday school. We need people to help. It would only be once a while, um, just to, to, you don't need to prepare anything, just to supervise really, and just to be an extra, an extra adult. So if you're able to help, even once a while uh, for that, that would be really helpful if you could put your name on the list. And if we now um, ask you for your tithes and offerings. Thanks. <laughs>
Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, each one, as we gather for fellowship and worship this morning and bring our gifts to you. We pray that you'll use them for the extension of your kingdom in this place. Bless the gift and the giver. Amen. We will now listen to the message from the band, followed by a message from the songsters. I know they have both prepared these contributions with the rest of us in mind. They spend time in preparation to enhance our worship and to give us time to think and consider the message running through each item they have prepared. We are in a privileged position here at Bedlington. Many corps miss out on this blessing as many corps no longer have a band or songsters. So let us make the most of this privilege and enjoy, look for the blessing and take on board the message behind both these items as they are given to us. Firstly, the band followed by the songsters I am sure that they will tell us what the items are.
Before I start the thought this morning, um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Ethan. The text's been an absolute nightmare this morning, and um, I was prepared to switch it off, but Ethan was prepared to stick in there and get it to work. So uh, thank you, Ethan. I know it doesn't feel like it, but you've been a star this morning. And uh, We thank you for that. It's complicated over there, and if it plays up, it plays up. And uh, it's done that all the way through this morning. So thank you, Ethan. As we look at the Bible reading, we see two interactions that ha happened very close together as Jesus visited Capernaum. The first being the healing of the paralyzed man, and the second, the encounter when Jesus eats with the collect tax collector and is referred in the re reading with sinners as well. The first thing that strikes me about both encounters is that in a way, Jesus pro provokes both interactions with the people gathered around him at the time. During the encounter with the paralyzed man, he provokes it by the words, wording he uses. This, provo this provocation leads to the question that allows him to confirm his, his authority to save men and everyone here on earth from sin. That was an important message to the disciples and the crowd and the people. Then, sorry, that was important. That was an important message to his disciples and to the crowd of people then, and is maybe an even more important message to the world today. In the second encounter, Jesus provokes the question about coming together and sharing food with sinners. At which point Jesus says the well-known passage it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And a more, an important message to the gathered crowd on the day, and again, an important message for all of us today. We need to avoid being an insular church or an insular community. I applaud the welcome you as a congregation give to those who visit us, but more can always be done and we need to redouble our efforts, not just here in this building, but in all aspects of our lives. I strongly believe God would only direct people searching for him to this place if we are ready to receive them, and only if we can encourage and nurture them. Why would he do anything else? I find it very interesting that the two encounters show Jesus not only taking the opportunity to spread his teaching, but engineering the opportunities to engage with the people who are around him. We need to take the opportunities given or engineered for us on this important part of our Christian life. 
If we look again at Jesus healing the paralyzed man, we can see Jesus again sat at the center and we can, see, we can assume the disciples and crowd would gather around his feet as was customary at the time. The closest probably sitting cross-legged on the floor with those who came later or deemed less important standing towards the back. Then unless there were queue jumpers, the ones arriving late or last of all would be sticking their heads through the windows and the doors trying to catch at least something of what was happening. We don't know for sure this is what it was like, but from the information that Bribe are reading, we can, we can deduce that the paralyzed man could not gain access. It suggests that the building, I'm supposing a house, was rammed with people who wanted to listen to Jesus. I see three groups of these people, and these have had me thinking about their reactions to what occurred and what can be learned or deduced. Firstly, the disciples. Secondly, the people who gathered listening to Jesus and asking him questions. And finally, the friends who carried the paralyzed man. And I'm gonna look at each three groups very briefly and then see what I can pull out of these encounters for us here this morning. The first group, the disciples. I am sure being a disciple of Jesus was not easy. I have heard many people say that the disciples were uneducated men and then using this as an excuse for the mistakes they made when around Jesus. However, as I said a couple of weeks ago, they would have been educated in religious matters from an early age and were exposed to the teaching of Jesus on a continual basis when they traveled with him. So maybe there were other factors at play. As I read through the teaching of Jesus, I get the impression that the disciples could often have been exhausted. They were constantly moving around they were also in effect his minders, protecting him, and they were often controlling how people met with him. I example, cutting the guard's ear off in Matthew, and Jesus rebu rebuking them for not letting the children approach them, also again in Matthew. I suspect they were also organizers, which was exampled in their role for feeding the 5,000. I, sus I suspect many times, just like at the healing of the paralyzed man, we can assume they were tired, exhausted, just looking to get to the end of this interaction and missing out on some of the things that were very important. Of course, I cannot say that was definitely the case, but if it were, it highlights an important message for us. The lesson I think we can take from this is our, in our Christian lives, in our Christian church, is that we must make sure we don't mix up the two cues, that being quality and quantity. The quality of what we do is much more important than the quantity. I'll say that again in case I got it wrong. The quality of what we do is much more important than the quantity. To bring another of my favorite sayings from my working life to you, which I used a lot, um, is there is no point being busy fools, or there is no point being unproductive fools. I'm sure you get the point. There is no point running around, exhausting ourselves for no return. And I do understand that for some people it may be a bit controversial. The second group of people were the people who were gathering to listen. I often wonder about the people who sat around listening to Jesus and asking questions, sometimes out of interest and sometimes simply trying to catch him out. How intent they were on what was being said to remain sat there as the roof above them disintegrated to allow the paralyzed man to be lowered down. It says something about their determination to hear the teaching of Jesus. Some of them probably being caught by the debris coming down as they sat there listening. To, to repeat myself, it shows fortitude and determination to hear what was being taught by Jesus. And I believe the lesson that can, we can take away from that is we need fortitude and determination in our journey to learn what the will of God is for us and for the Bedlington Corps as a whole. Only then can we expect to move forward and not stand still or slip backwards. I have found you can't stand still. An attempt to do so only results in moving backwards, if you want to or not. It's just like trying to stand still on a very steep stand, sand dune. It is impossible. It does not happen. The third group being the friends who carry the paralyzed man. Who were the friends? 
And what was the motivation that brought them to bring the paralyzed man to the place where Jesus was teaching? They must have been good at carrying this man to get him there, to get him to where he wanted to be. And then when they could not gain access, they carried him upstairs to the building's flat roof. This part of the passage always makes me smile. I must confess uh, to this, always making me smile, although it should not be funny at all. I picture, the picture that always springs to mind is watching a football or other such match on TV. The stretcher runs on to take the injured player off. They gently lift the player and carefully lift the player under the stretcher. They lift the stretcher up and off they go. Then one of the stretcher bearers suddenly trips or drops the stretcher. The player launches off the side into the turf, hurting themselves more than they were already hurt in the first place. I know things have changed and many are now strapped to the stretcher, but one scene always remembered. Four men carrying, four men carrying a man for what was probably some distance is not as easy as it first seems and it requires some skill. Then it gets more complicated. They were late and they couldn't get in. Even carrying a man, it seems, uh, no one was going to let them in. For what reason, we do not know. It could have been the stigma, stigma of being paralyzed that has existed at, at that time, or the fact that nobody wanted to give up the place. I am sure they would have tried very hard to get in. You do not carry a man that far just to give up at the first difficulty but nowhere could be found. So what did they do next? They thought out the box. They tried a different solution. Indeed tried a radical solution to the issue. The, loose, the solution was to carry the paralyzed man to the roof, probably difficult in itself, and then knock a hole in the roof again, not as easy as it sounds, probably destroying the flat roof to lower the man down on a rug. What do I think we can learn from these men in this situation? In simple terms, whenever we attempt to do, whatever we attempt to do on a Christian path, no, how, no matter how simple it looks when we start, it will probably end up being much more complicated than we ever anticipated. And we need the determination and radical thinking to move forward. This brings me back to where I started. We need all of you because every one of you are very important members of our church and congregation to help us move forward. The church or the core here is not the leadership team. We do not know all the answers. The church here is every single one of you and every single one of you is important in God's eyes. We are guilty of not saying it enough. We are guilty of not saying that every single one of you are important to God and important to this church. My plea to you is that if you leave with no other part of this thought, please leave knowing you are loved by God and you are important to him and all the church family that gather here. We abound in talent in this church and God give us talent for one reason and it is to use this talent to extend his kingdom here on earth. We do not tap into this ta talent as much as we should as a church and, is, and it is up to all of us to improve that situation. I leave that as my final challenge to you here this morning and repeat it. We do not tap into this talent as much as we should as a church and it is up to all of us to improve that situation as we go on. As always in a meeting here, the mercy seat is open and available and if you want to pray and communicate with God, the opportunity is available during our final song. The final song is King of Kings and it is 376 if you're using the songbook. And if you are able and want, I suggest we stand for the last song and then the benediction that will follow.